live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. I mean this in the nicest way possible. Actually, scratch that. No, I don't. What the hell is going on in Jacksonville? I've given up trying to figure out everything that's happening with this head coaching search. One hour, it's Byron Leftwich in. The next, it's Trent Baalke overruled it and Leftwich isn't coming. The next, it flip-flops again. I have a serious headache watching all this go down. I've experienced just about every part of this emotional roller coaster, and I want to get off this ride as soon as possible. This entire situation has been absolutely pathetic, reeks of incompetency, and is one of the craziest coaching sagas that I can remember, and not in a good way. However, as chaotic and as disastrous as this entire saga has been, nothing can possibly compare to what happened with the Chicago Bears in 1999. That offseason, the Chicago Bears were looking to hire a brand new head coach, and turned to this man right here. This was Arizona Cardinals defensive coordinator Dave McGinnis. And on January 22, 1999, McGinnis was officially announced as the new head coach of the Bears. There was just one small problem. Yeah, McGinnis never actually took the job, and had no idea that he was becoming the head coach of the Bears. And this saga ended in absolutely embarrassing fashion. This is the story behind the strangest coaching search in the history of the NFL. Before I talk about the search in question, we need some context to understand how we got to this point, why the Bears were looking for a brand new coach, and why Dave McGinnis was the hot name on the market that the Bears were going after. Our story begins in 1993, when the Chicago Bears hired Dave Wanstead to be their new head coach. He had some pretty big shoes to fill, as he was replacing the only man to ever win a Super Bowl with the team in Mike Ditka. And things started off alright. In his second season in 1994, he got in the Bears to the playoffs. It even got them into the divisional round before they fell to the eventual Super Bowl champion San Francisco 49ers. But after 1994, everything went downhill. From 1995 to 97, Wanstead missed the playoffs all three years, and the team was seemingly getting worse, going from 9-7 in 1995 to 7-9 in 1996 to 4-12 in 1997, which was the team's worst record since 1973. Somewhat surprisingly, Wanstead was allowed to return for the 1998 season, but everyone knew that his seat was absolutely flaming hot. He needed to turn things around quickly, or he was out. And as you can probably tell by the title of this video, he did not do that at all. Once again, the Chicago Bears were one of the worst teams in football, and the season ended in disaster, with the team once again going 4-12 and finishing dead last in the NFC Central. Nothing about Chicago was good that season, as they finished 25th out of 30 teams in total offense and 23rd in total defense. Only one team in the NFC, with that team being the Philadelphia Eagles at 3-13, finished with a worse record than Chicago. The season started off poorly, with the Bears dropping their first four games, and it ended poorly, with the team losing seven of their final eight games coming off of the bye week. Dave Wanstead could not turn the team around, and especially since he was only 1-11 in six seasons against the hated Green Bay Packers, it was kind of surprising that it even lasted this long. Nevertheless, when the 1998 season mercifully came to an end, Wanstead was out of a job ending a disastrous stint where he went 41-57, won less than 42% of his games, and never had a season with double-digit wins. Now the Bears needed a replacement to right the ship and turn things around. And they knew just where to turn to. For this, they were going to go down to the desert. In 1998, the Arizona Cardinals shocked a ton of people when, for the first time since moving to Arizona, for the first time since the strike shortened season in 1982, and for the first time in a normal regular season since 1975, they made it to the postseason. And a big reason why the Cardinals made it and went on this shocking run, even though they were just 6-7 and seven through their first 13 games, was because of their defense. The defense was fantastic at forcing takeaways, forcing the third most turnovers in football. Arizona forced 39 turnovers in 16 games for an average of about 2.5 per game. Only the Atlanta Falcons and Seattle Seahawks forced more, and the Falcons made it to the Super Bowl that year. As a side note, to learn more about that Falcons team that made it to the Super Bowl, click the card in the upper right corner. Over the final three weeks of the regular season, Arizona allowed just 47 points, never allowing more than 17 in any game. In their regular season finale against the San Diego Chargers that got them into the playoffs, they forced five turnovers. And in the wildcard round against the heavily favored Dallas Cowboys, a team that they lost to twice in the regular season, they pulled off a stunning upset. How they did it was on the strength of their defense. Arizona won the game 20-7, and with four minutes left in the game, the Cowboys had yet to score a single point. Dallas had 15 drives in that game, and only one of them resulted in points. The Cowboys turned it over three times, and on their first 12 drives, were held to a mere 183 total yards of offense. 
And Troy Aikman was sacked four times and went 22 for 49 with 191 yards passing, three interceptions, and a passer rating of 37, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball to the ground on every single play. This was a defensive masterclass that the entire country was watching. And the man orchestrating this, well, that was defensive coordinator Dave McGinnis. And when the 1998 season ended, the strength of Arizona's defense down the stretch made McGinnis an attractive option for the Bears coaching vacancy. The Bears wanted to replace one Dave with another. And it made sense why, especially since from 1986 to 95, McGinnis was the linebackers coach of the Bears. Before he became the defensive coordinator of the Cardinals in 1996, he was a highly successful assistant coach with the Bears for a decade, and was so well regarded that even when Dicka got fired after the 1992 season and the coaching staff changed, McGinnis kept his job. And so on January 22nd, 1999, the Chicago Bears officially announced that their new head coach would be the man who called Chicago home for a decade. Dave McGinnis was going to be the man in charge. There was just one small, tiny problem that the Bears failed to take into consideration. Yeah, McGinnis never took the job. When I say that this whole situation was bizarre, I truly mean it. So buckle up, because this is a prime example of how not to do a contract negotiation. The Bears were interested in McGinnis, and McGinnis, understandably so, was interested in the Bears and was interested in becoming the next head coach. The two sides met in Chicago, with his wife and his agent there as well. Now, this is where the reports become a bit conflicting, but the main idea is the same. McGinnis insisted that the Bears never offered him any contract, and that at no point were any terms even discussed. Meanwhile, sources close to the Bears indicate that this was false, and that McGinnis was offered a contract. However, McGinnis was upset because the money was not great. McGinnis was searching for somewhere in the ballpark of $1 million per year, which is what the going rate seemed to be for recently hired coaches. The Bears, on the other hand, were offering less than that. Either way, the two sides, while interested, were not close on a deal. McGinnis then got a good night of sleep in his hotel room and went to the facility the next day while his wife stayed behind in the hotel. And that's where things got really wild. At 9 o'clock, a memo went out around the office saying that McGinnis had agreed to terms and was the new head coach of the team. 30 minutes later, the Bears contacted the press and alerted them that at 1 o'clock, there would be a press conference making the news official. McGinnis got to the facility at 10.30 and was congratulated by team president Michael McCaskey on becoming the next head coach. Naturally, McGinnis was confused because the two sides were still far apart and because McGinnis hadn't taken an offer. However, at this moment, not only did he find out that the press had been called, but his wife found out while watching TV in the hotel room that this was going on. By one o'clock, when the press conference was supposed to take place, McGinnis was still meeting with McCaskey and team officials, voicing his frustration at the entire situation. The 75 members of the press that were in attendance were naturally and understandably confused about what was happening. But Ted Phillips, the vice president of operations for the team, assured them that everything was fine and that there was going to be a late start to the press conference. That late start was two and a half hours later at 3.30, when team spokesman Brian Harlan met with the press, apologized for the inconvenience, and told them that there was no deal. Keep in mind that Chicago was already bungling this search pretty badly. Including the Bears, nine teams had had coaching vacancies, and all of the minus Chicago's had been filled. This was not making things better. And things got so bad that McGinnis packed his bags and left. Obviously, we couldn't reach an agreement. I mean, it started, uh, you know, there was an announcement made, obviously, before we had uh, even agreed to any terms. And then, uh, you know, it, it, it went downhill from there. Dave had given his word to several people that we would talk to them personally, being our families, Mr. Bidwell, Vince, and that didn't happen. And um, it was just... Uh, not right. By this point, McGinnis was absolutely furious with how the Bears were handling this entire situation. It wasn't fair to him, wasn't fair to the Cardinals, and wasn't fair to his wife and to his agent. The relationship between the two sides had soured hard, and things got so bad and desperate for Chicago that Chairman Ed McCaskey, who was in Florida during all this, tried to contact McGinnis via telephone, apologizing for everything and begging him to take the job. But that ship had sailed. At this point, McGinnis was more than content with being a defensive coordinator in Arizona for another year than taking over that mess of an organization in Chicago that completely screwed him over with this entire process. McGinnis didn't speak publicly on the specifics of the issue for a long time, but in 2018 went in-depth on the situation. As McGinnis said, he was never offered a contract, and the interview with the team, which was supposed to be one day, was now stretched to an additional day. When McGinnis woke up the next day, he got a call from Leslie Frazier, who McGinnis wanted to hire on his staff presumably as the defensive backs coach. Frazier asked McGinnis if he was going to be offered a job on his staff, because he had offers coming in from elsewhere, and Frazier wanted to work with McGinnis, so he would have turned down the other opportunities in order to join his staff. 
Megan has said that he doesn't know what Frazier's talking about, because he hasn't taken a job yet. To which Frazier replied that it was on the radio for the past hour, and that there was going to be a press conference in an hour announcing him as the new head coach. The Bears maintain that McGinnis walked away from the job because he got cold feet. McGinnis maintains that he walked away from the job because, well, he was never offered the job in the first place, and because the organization completely mishandled the entire situation. Whatever the case, Chicago, the last team with a head coaching vacancy, still had a head coaching vacancy to fill. They had what seemed like a surefire thing in Dave McGinnis. They had a hot defensive coordinator who knew the city, knew what Bears football was about, and had proven his worth with the team for a decade. And there was mutual interest on both sides, and they somehow fumbled the bag with this bizarre premature announcement. As for how this whole situation played out in the end, well, let's just say I don't think anyone won here. With regards to how the Bears moved past this embarrassing debacle, they wound up hiring Dick Duran to be their next head coach. Duran had been the defensive coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars for the past four seasons, and had done a fine job with that defense, helping guide them to the postseason in each of the past three years. As for how his stint with the Bears went, yeah, it wasn't great. Outside of one of the biggest flukes of all time, where they went 13-3 in 2001 and finished with the number two seed, the Bears did nothing under his watch. They never won a playoff game, never had a winning record outside of 2001, and in those five seasons, went 35-45, and 45, winning just under 44% of the time. Duran was fired after the 2003 season. As a side note, if you want to learn more about Nick Duran's coaching career, click the card in the upper right corner. As for Dave McGinnis, the good news for him was that he would get his opportunity to be a head coach in the NFL. After serving as a defensive coordinator for the Arizona Cardinals again in 1999, in 2000, following a 2-5 start to the season, head coach Vince Tobin was let go, and McGinnis became the interim head coach. The bad news was that his time in Arizona at his new post was absolutely dreadful. He somehow stayed on as a head coach in 2001, even though the Cards went 1-8 in the nine games they played when he took over, and the Cards were awful every year under McGinnis, going 7-9 in 2001, 5-11 in 2002, and 4-12 in 2003. McGinnis was fired after the 2003 season, going 17-40 in three and a half seasons, winning less than 30% of his games. I guess you could say the Bears dodged a bullet and came out on top here, but let's be honest, there weren't really any winners in this situation. So what's the moral of the story here? Do not announce that you're hiring a head coach before, you know, you actually hire the head coach. Do not make any premature announcements, do not call the press in, and do not send out any memos within the organization until the ink on the piece of paper is dry, all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, and until you are absolutely, positively, 100% sure that the man you're hiring to be your head coach is going to be your head coach. The Bears have had a lot of embarrassing moments in their franchise's history, but considering how badly they bungled this entire situation, this might have been the most embarrassing one of them all. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.